Hello. Today I want to talk about the drops that are routinely used in eye examinations for young children, uh, particularly in hospital eye clinics. Now, if you take your child along to the hospital and they have drops and you have no concerns about it, then you may not need to carry on listening to this uh, because if you have no concerns, there's nothing for you to worry about. This talk is aimed at those parents who do have concerns for whatever reason. So for those parents, I'm trying to give you some information about the drops so that you can make an informed decision about whether you want a consent for drops for your particular child. Now, the drops that we use routinely have two purposes. First of all, to help in the examination of a child's eyes for long sight, short sight, and to determine a spectacle prescription. And the second reason is to examine the health of the interior of the eyes. So let's just talk about the first one first of all. When we measure a child's long or short sight spectacle prescription, we use the term refraction. We do this by retinoscopy, which is shining a light into the child's eyes and looking at the light that's reflected back. Children's and adults' eyes do reflect light back, rather like cat's eyes, but ours are, our eyes are not as reflective um, as cats, so we need a special torch uh, to enable us to see the reflected light. Typical children have very active focusing muscles in their eyes. And when we're refracting typical young children, very often without drops, their eyes will be changing focus. And that means we can get a false reading of their spectacle prescription or we get a reading that's constantly changing as we're trying to measure it. So using drops that paralyse the focusing muscles of a child's eyes is actually quite useful when we see typical children. Now, hospital eye clinics, by and large, their greatest proportion of patients are typical children. And therefore, the use of drops has become routine, it's written into protocols, and it's largely unquestioned. Now, the second use is to dilate the pupils, make the pupils much larger, so that we can get a really thorough examination of the interior of our patient's eyes. An eyeball is like a ball. Imagine there's a tiny hole like a pupil in the front of this ball and I'm going to try and look inside to judge the health of the inside. If the hole is very small then I can see right to the back but I can't get round to right out to the edges round here. To see right round here, I've got to have a much bigger hole. So if we're going to do the most thorough examination of the eyes of a child or an adult, we cannot do it without drops. But we're going to come back to that. Let me just put my ball away. So let's go back to refracting children's eyes and I said that typical children have very active focusing um, and it's much much easier to test their eyes with drops. What we know is that children with Down syndrome don't have as active focusing as typical children. In fact they focus much much less readily 
So when we refract children with Down syndrome, we don't actually need to put the drops in because they naturally relax their eyes. I've been testing children with Down syndrome for over 35 years without drops and I see a lot of children who also are seen at the hospital and I almost always get exactly the same answer without drops as the hospital is arriving at with drops because the children can relax and stop focusing quite naturally the key being that the child is comfortable and enjoying the experience the child relaxes and their eyes naturally relax i think there's a reasonable argument for using drops for the very first examination that a child has. That means that the examiner is absolutely confident in the spectacle prescription. But in follow-up appointments, there is no need to use drops. And at the very least, the examiner should be trying without drops before they even consider whether drops are actually needed. If they do that, they'll find that very few children with Down syndrome need drops and they'll become more and more confident at testing the children without. Now let's go back to thinking about uh, examining the health of the eyes. A thorough examination of the interior of a child's eyes is really important on the first occasion. Children with Down syndrome have a different appearance or often have a different appearance of the interior of their eyes. So it's really important that we establish what is normal for that child. What we don't want to happen is an examiner, when the child is much older, seeing something abnormal, panicking, worrying you that something has developed. So I think an examination with drops is important for the very first time so that it's recorded exactly what unusual features, if there are any, are normal in that particular child. And while that's important, we might as well incorporate it with the same examination to measure long sight or short sight. Now, the drops that are usually used in the UK are called cyclopentylate. And a lot of parents have a worry because Down syndrome is in the guidelines in some countries as a contraindication for cyclopentylate, particularly in the States. So if we Google cyclopentylate and Down syndrome, what pops up is an awful lot of sites with guidelines not to use cyclopentylate in uh, children with Down syndrome because of the increased risk of toxicity. And there's absolutely no doubt that there are reports of toxic reactions or adverse reactions to cyclopentylate in children with Down syndrome but there are also reports in typical children as well and the adverse reactions are extremely rare. In the UK our guidelines for the use of cyclopentylate don't mention Down syndrome at all and almost all practitioners, including myself, would consider it a safe drug to use for children 
with or without Down syndrome. It's used so routinely in hospital eye clinics that thousands of typical children and hundreds of children with Down syndrome have cyclopentylate in their eyes every day in the UK with no medical adverse reactions. So if your concern about drops is about the medical safety of the drops, I think you can put your mind at rest and consider them safe. But when you're consenting to eye drops, there are other considerations to think about. Some children don't mind having drops in their eyes. It doesn't worry them at all and that's absolutely fine. Other children, particularly those with special needs and or Down syndrome, find it an extremely distressing experience. The drops sting. There's no getting away from it. They do actually hurt. And the action of instilling the drops can be extremely distressing for some children. So what happens is that they get very, very upset. The next time they go to the hospital, they're fearful. They are much more distressed about it. And what happens is the hospital staff then hold them down to put the drops in. That makes the matter much worse. And what you're left with is a child who is so terrified of eye examinations that eye examinations become impossible. And I see a number of children who have been driven to that state by the unthinking installation of eye drops in hospital clinics. So those children, there has to be an alternative. And the alternative is obviously not instilling eye drops for refraction. Typical children find that the eye drops wear off very quickly within hours. The time taken depends very much on the colour of your eyes. But a lot of children with Down syndrome find that the effects last much longer. Now, when you've had the drops in and your eye muscles have been paralysed, focusing muscles have been paralysed, you obviously can't change focus. You may not be able to see clearly at distance if you're long sighted. And you certainly can't see clearly at near. And that in itself can be disturbing. We know that children with Down syndrome are visual learners. So it's arguable that it's much more disturbing for a child with Down syndrome than for a typical child to have had the drops in. And if the drops are going to last days rather than hours, it's going to impact on the child's learning. So I think that's another consideration uh, when we're thinking about instilling drops into a child's eyes. Let's go back now. Uh, we've discussed why it's not necessary to use drops except for the first occasion uh, to refract a child with Down syndrome. Let's go back to examining the health child's eyes. Children with Down syndrome are no more likely to develop diseases of the interior of the eye than our typical children and in all children those conditions are in extremely rare. So a thorough examination might be important on the first occasion. Thereafter there is no good argument for dilating the pupils to examine the health of the interior of any child's eyes if there are no concerns. A 
huge proportion, probably as high as 95% of children in the UK go through their entire childhood and indeed through most of their adulthood until we get old and diseases become more common without ever having the health of their eyes examined with drops. And no one worries about that. It's not something that occupies uh, those of us in the eye care professions because we know that diseases of the eye are so rare. Of course, if there are concerns about your child's eyes, if they develop a condition, if they have an already diagnosed a condition that might progress, if their vision is, has dropped, if their visual behaviour has changed, then it might be really important to put drops in to examine the health of their eyes. But on a routine visit, to my mind, there is no justification. So, to summarise, if you have no concerns whatsoever about drops in your child, then don't worry, continue having them. But if you have concerns, you need to discuss those concerns with the staff in your child's eye clinic. It may be that they are prepared to examine your child without drops. It may be that they can discuss alternative drops as opposed to cyclopentolate if you're worried about the health implications of cyclopentolate. But what is crucial is that you remember consent is needed before anyone can instill drops in your child's eyes. And if you are at all anxious about giving your consent, discuss it and don't feel pressurised to do something that is going to make you uncomfortable and that is going to distress your child. Thanks for listening. See you in some other video.